much about Debbie Aloyo. She's going to have to introduce herself. Um, she is in Africa. I don't know what nation she's in. I forgot. She works for the Gould Family Foundation across several nations, providing um, direct medical therapies in clinics. Um, and I'm really looking forward to her talk. Um, as you guys may perceive, and it, it may not have been the best organization, this conference started out with university researchers talking about research and proof of concepts designs. Pierre and Larry have just talked about regulation and and design for manufacture, two things that are absolutely necessary to have clinical value. And now Debbie, um, Dr. Eva Baroni, um, uh, Alejandra Velez, and some other people are gonna start talking about clinical applications and needs. Um, so we're, we're getting to the actual patient in this part of the conference. So thank you, um, everybody. Please welcome Debbie Loyo. Thank you very much, Robert. And uh, hello, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, Deborah Aloyo, um, the manager of biomedical programs and operations of Gould Family Foundation. I'm based in Kampala, Uganda, and I'm happy to be here today. So, um, yeah, Robert reached out to me and 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 asked me to share with you my experience on. Uh, what are the needs for African uh, medical device design, designs? And, and those are the questions that I hope to, to answer today. So um, just so you know, um, it's not by design that I have this device right here. It is a, a portable light source and it is with me for a reason. Um, in Africa, we have what called sometimes load shedding. And um, it's quite interesting that my power went off immediately. I started my presentation. So I think it will be um, quite interesting and it will have an impact on, on, on my discussion today. Yes, so what is, uh, when you're talking about medical equipment designs, you'll have to start um, uh, asking the question, what is the status quo? We have had a lot of, uh, previous presenters talking about assessment of where the equipment that uh, are, are designed, where they're used. And one of the important things to think about is where, or uh, what is the status of this equipment in Africa? Uh, what, what is the status at the moment? And one thing you'll notice that in Africa, 8% of medical equipment are donated. So, as, as, I, as I point out these questions, I want everyone to think about, okay, what does this translate to? What do these issues translate, translate to? What does the status quo translate to? So 8% of medical equipment are donated. So what does that mean? It means that most of the equipment that are in Africa are using health facilities are actually not designed for health facilities in Africa. Uh, you, you'll note that the very, there's a very limited number of biomedical professionals. Those are the engineers, the technicians, and apprentices. And of course, what does that translate to? We're going to discuss all that later on. You, you, you then have to ask yourself uh, when you're designing, are there biomed programs in the, in, in the health facilities, in the hospitals that we are designing for medical equipment? Uh, what do I mean when I say biomed program? Is there budget for preventive maintenance, for biomed support of the equipment? Is there inventory? of these equipment that are actually in the facilities, do we know which equipment are actually installed in most of these facilities? Do these equipment have maintenance schedules? In other words, uh, we, in, in the biomed world, you have to do the servicing of the equipment, just like we service our vehicles. Every now and then, the equipment too needs servicing to operate properly. Then something to think about is the infrastructure. And, and this directly relates to, um, I think my situation right now could give an example of how easily uh, electricity is it's 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 an important resource that is not readily available to everyone uh, there is poor infrastructure infrastructure in terms of water electricity in terms of also the staffing so then that takes me back to the engineering design process when engineers come to the table they will definitely identify uh, they'll define a problem, identify what the need is. And, and then from that, from 
from identifying the need, then they will come up with solutions of uh, uh, to solve the needs that have been identified. But also part of that is identifying the constraints attached to that problem. And this is where the critical, this is the critical aspect when, when it comes to designing for Africa. With mind the four issues that uh, I mentioned, uh, one has to think about the life cycle of a medical device. Uh, when designing for Africa, uh, we always talk about cost effective. Everyone says, oh, we need to design an equipment that is cost effective. But what does that really mean? Cost effective, um, it means having a device that is affordable. But what is it just having a device that's affordable? There's so many things that are attached to cost. And we're going to look at what that looks like. So. From my perspective, cost means evaluating the cost of a medical equipment life cycle, the whole life cycle as a whole. Then where does that start from? The cost starts with defining what the, the end user pays for that equipment. We have seen 80% of equipment are donated. What does that insinuate? It definitely insinuates that many facilities, many hospitals actually do not purchase their medical equipment. So then translating that to having a device that is cost effective is very important. Then thinking about the installation, once you've designed a device and it's ready for use on the market, then there are additional costs that need to be considered right even from the beginning as you're in the design phase that uh, need to be addressed. What are the costs for installation? If the installation is very long, if it's very technical, then what does that translate to? It translates to having personnel that uh, can do the installation of the equipment. But then what does the, what's the situation in Africa? There are a limited number of personnel who have been trained by manufacturers. So as manufacturers and, and engineers are coming together to get um, equipment for Africa, consideration has to be put into how can we make systems that are standalone that you can pick from the manufacturer's warehouse, shipped and delivered to the health facility and it's ready for use without pre, let's say pre site, uh, site preparation. Once all those things come in, then the cost goes up. I'll give an example of uh, oxygen systems. I actually visited a, a facility recently in Kenya and a PSA plant, oxygen plant had been delivered but guess what? It was just waiting for the installation because there was no one to do the installation. The, the, the people who had purchased were able to buy the, 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 the plant, but they're not able to install it and actually use and have an impact because the person who is trained is not readily available. So these are things that uh, um, the, the person who is right from the divine design phase uh, that needs to be considered. If I can make my device easy to install, then the costs go down. So long-term, what does that look, uh, look like? Long-term means servicing. Just like your car needs servicing, the medical equipment too needs servicing to, to, to produce quality results. Servicing, uh, servicing looks at what are the costs of the service contract? What is interesting is many governments uh, are able to purchase very expensive equipment from high-end manufacturers and all that. But then when you look at the service contract, the cost of the service contract um, after three years is the price of buying a new machine, which is quite interesting because it then means there is a break between the purchase, the one-year warranty, and then the next two years, because no one is paying for the for the for the cost of the service contracts. No one is buying the service contracts. So these are things that need to be considered. And what makes the service contracts expensive? Expensive spare parts, long procedures for testing. Um, if if uh, if if the procedures for doing the preventive maintenance for servicing are very long. That, trans, that drives up the cost of the, of, the, of the service contract, whether it's a basic service contract, which does not include the spare parts, or a, service, uh, a comprehensive service contract, which includes the spare parts. Something that is important, spare parts. The cost of spare parts is very crucial in the life cycle of equipment. If the cost of the spare parts is high, you will definitely find a number of equipment they're purchased brand new, they're functioning properly, but because let's 
pay one small part that is very unique to that equipment and it's quite expensive because it's unique uh, the suppliers know that they're the only ones who can distribute it in locally they're the only ones who can deliver it to 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 the end user they hike up that cost actually i have a very personal experience with this the manufacturer when we reach out to the manufacturer for an oxygen concentrator, I will not mention names, uh, they, they referred us to the distributor, the local distributor. And this local distributor shared with us the same quotation we had received from the manufacturer. But guess what? The cost was actually 40 times more than what we would have paid. It was actually $1,400, yet the cost the manufacturer had given us was $1,000. And this was exclusive of the shipping costs and the taxes because we were shipping directly from the manufacturer to us. So having the impact between um, that impact between the, the, the connection between the manufacturer and the end user and the cost of the spares is very important. Having sustainable uh, spare parts, uh, someone mentioned earlier on that if we can combine a number of parts together and reduce the need for multiple spare parts that will reduce the cost of the equipment and of also reduce the cost of course of the life cycle of the equipment. So these are critical areas that are very important. We have talked about tools, barmaid tools. This is a huge challenge. Um, many, given the fact that there are limited barmaid technicians and engineers, there are even more limited barmaid technicians and engineers with the appropriate tools. I will consider myself very lucky. And, um, and I do have a box of tools that I carry around whenever I visit some of our partners. But what is, what is interesting is I recently visited a partner and they did have a CBC machine. But guess what? The, 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 one of the, the screws that uh, allow you to print the machine um, were a torx screw. And I do not have any tool to open up uh, this machine. So it's quite interesting. This all comes from the start of the design process. If, if you are designing an equipment and you're not putting into consideration one, the cost of the tools that the barmaid needs, the uniqueness of the tools that have been used, uh, the, the parts that have been used on the machine, um, if they're not considered it's the difference between a repair of an equipment or a service of equipment and its and and its um, and its utilization. Another critical part, which is very important, is training. User training is, I will say, um, the most crucial part of uh, of an equipment uh, um, life cycle. When when equipment are installed, you will notice that many times. Uh, about 60% of all the requests that come into the biomed uh, department, most of them are actually uh, user errors. And this is because user training has not been done. Of course, the contribution is because there are no biomed personnel, but also because the training is not available to the users. So as, as someone is designing medical equipment, they have to put into consideration if it's a complex medical equipment, does this, this equipment require an application specialist? How can I make the application specialist available? What training can we avail the application specialist? In addition to that, who is to use the equipment? All those questions, are especially when designing for Africa, because uh, I'll give an example, an ultrasound machine, you will not have just an, a sonographer use the equipment. It will be a, a sonographer, an ultrasound technician, and also an ultrasound a, a technician apprentice. So those are different people with different knowledge. How can you make an equipment, uh, the user training as simple in a way that it's made quickly available to also address staff turnovers, which is an issue. Many staff come in and out. So making training very easy, short, uh, many people design Bibles, actually most of the user manuals for a number of equipment as big as Bibles. And unfortunately, because of that, people end up not reading the, 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 the manuals. So something that I've, I've been quite familiar with is now designing quick user guides, which are one, two, three steps for users to, to, to give them a guide on how to op operate the machine in the shortest time possible. Of course, some of the things that uh, designers don't think about right from the beginning. Some manufacturers have become good at this, uh, but it is the technical training manuals. Uh, having these accessible to barmaid technicians, to the user, to, to hospital um, management, so that they are able to avail the, to, to their, their technical staff. Then, of course, the critical 
parties BAMED training. This is the training, the manufacturer from uh, the supply of equipment to the end um, technicians. So those are the apprentices, the biomedical engineers and technicians. The training is very critical. Having that available, because it's not available, many biomeds, although they are available, then, but they are not able to do the required preventive maintenance and that hinders the utilization of the equipment. A very important thing, which I put as an intersection between all areas is compatibility. When we talk about designing for, for the world, it's important important in a time where we are in a pandemic to be able to share resources and allocate resources to places that are in need the most. But if we are all designing and that meet very specific area standards and not meeting standards of where they're actually destined to be, I'll give an example. If an equipment is coming from the US, it's coming in with a voltage rating of 110 volts. But in Uganda, uh, where I'm located, it will step up transformer to operate at 220 volts. And what does that mean? It means that many times you will purchase a step up transformer. If it's not purchased, then it, which many times most of the donated equipment do not come with the, the transformer. So the end plug to, into outlets of two, uh, 220 volts and they blow up. So eventually the equipment end up in a graveyard. So those are some of the considerations. If we're trying to make resources available, then can we consider designing uh, equipment that can be used in the US, in Africa, in Europe? And uh, I believe that is one way we can, we can increase the access of equipment. Of course, things that are important, language. What is surprising is many, some of the equipment that come in, um, you will get a brand new equipment, but when you try to operate it, you realize that it's in a different language. And obviously, even um, although you try to type, sometimes you are unable to even type in a, a character or a, a letter that you don't understand. So you're unable to use the equipment. And up, actually, this is a big, very big problem with large procurements uh, uh, by government hospitals. It's, it's a very big problem because this is the equipment that end up in the graveyard, in the hospital graveyard, uh, doing nothing because they cannot be operated by anyone. No one understands the language. So that is something very important. Something that uh, um, designers need to think about is how can we make our spare parts of the agents, our consumables, compatible with other manufacturers? This is some very important because if you design unique spare parts that cannot be found anywhere else and the supply chains are not uh, are not a uh, not adequate to support the delivery of these spare parts, consumables, and reagents. Then these are the equipment that, after some time, uh, when people fail to get the spare parts, still end up in the graveyard. So it's important to have, let's say, systems that are open to accept uh, used by by uh, by products or parts from other manufacturers. Then something that's also important when it comes to compatibility is tools. Like I said, uh, if, if we have the metric system in Africa and you're designing an, an equipment with end goal uh, or destiny in Africa, then putting into consideration what are the tools that are required and, and, and are they compatible with what I'm designing? Those are very important questions. Software. I'll give an example. Um, you, when it comes to imaging software, there is what we call the DICOM uh, software, which is used for transferring images. And it's, it's the standard. Uh, but you will find certain manufacturers want to be unique for some reason and use a totally different software, which is not readily available. And what that means is because it's not easily accessible and people cannot purchase new softwares out of the blue because there are no budgets for medical equipment, there are no budgets for, for, uh, for purchase of this equipment. So it's hard to get new softwares out of the blue and that becomes a challenge. Then that is a system which is actually put aside or uh, information is not easily shared. Infrastructure. Uh, this is, uh, I've already mentioned how this directly impacts designing with backup. Having in mind that if, if, if let's say in the US, uh, a generator is automated in a hospital, it will kick in in about, let's say maximum, I don't know, 10 seconds. In Africa, you have to think about, okay, what is the time it takes for the technician to get the key for the generator house, go open it, and switch it on. That is if he's on site. So those are things that you have to think about. Okay, 
then what does that mean? Batteries, how, how long should my battery last? Uh, do we need to install stabilizers? Have inbuilt stabilizers for the equipment because of the power surges? Uh, should I design my medical equipment compatible with uh, solar outlets? Um, and of course, there are a number of things that need, that need to be considered. When you think about um, infrastructure, you're looking at water, you're, med you're looking at medical gas source alternatives. I'll give an example of anesthesia machines. So medical gases, uh, anesthesia machines uh, deliver anesthetic agent to a patient who's undergoing up, uh, an operation procedure. So how can you deliver the anesthetic agent without necessarily using uh, oxygen, you can perhaps deliver it using compressed air. Perhaps you can use a draw of a method and draw air literally from the environment by the, the patient's breathing to the to the patient to deliver the anesthetic gas. Can you uh, be able to to um, to 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 use alternatives? Your design can it provide alternatives to what is already existing. And those are things that to think about. Of course, the environment is something very important. Things like dust, is the equipment dust resistant? Oxygen concentrators depend on filters. If those filters are not cleaned weekly, especially in a busy NICU, then these are instances where your, 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 your oxygen concentrators will no longer provide uh, filtration of the right oxygen to their patients. So in summary, if you look at uh, designing for Africa, the number of things that need to be considered, looking at the cost and not just the cost, but the life cycle, look at the whole life cycle, how does that impact on, 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 that, on the design of the equipment, user training, how compatible is your design to 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 where you're, you're you're intending it to to be to be installed, the infrastructure and environment, all those are very critical. Yeah, I want to thank you all for listening to me and the opportunity to, to share with you my perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deborah. You've been getting a lot of kudos in the in the chat here. You probably can't read them while you're while you're doing it, but I, I wanted you to finish early because I have some very, some things that I think are very important to say. I think you're shining a light on something which had just kind of formed in my brain, but, but I think now I understand. I mean, basically the open source community has not yet stepped up to this, but we can. This is a challenge that we can meet. Right now, the proof of concepts that are being made in universities do not take all of these things into account. And I'm not sure they can because students can only do so much. But if we take the stuff that Larry Kilazuski was talking about, the design for manufacture, at that phase, we can bring these things in. And what I'm imagining is a culture of building bulletproof parts, right? Like, or I, I don't know in English the right word for it. Very, very rugged, very, very reliable equipment, more so than what we're normally used to. Now, the open source community has not even stepped up to design for manufacture yet. Therefore, it, it's a lot to ask, but I believe we can do it because there are little parts of the hobby community. And this is an example. This is the, the Arduino. One of the great things about this, it was designed for students that if you're not an electrical engineer, this won't make very much sense to you, but it's almost impossible to destroy this by making a mis an electrical mistake. The other chips and things like that, if you touch two wires together, it will destroy the chip. That is, this is a very rugged device electrically, not physically, but electrically, it's a very powerful device. And that's one of the reasons it's, it's successful. Students can use it and they make a mistake and they don't have to throw away their equipment because they just made one little, little mistake. And because of that, this device is taking over the world of electronics. I believe if we identify a culture we can step up to this and we can make it really fun, right? Like we can make hackathons, like let's try to build things that we can drop off buildings and throw in a swamp and pick up and still have it used, you know, and we, we, can, we can make a lot of fun with this. And it, it's a design challenge, which today we're not thinking about, but I believe the, the, the same people who are working at Cambridge and Rice to do the proof of concept things, can solve these problems if they will reach out to people like Debbie who know what is needed and will invest and value it. Now, one thing I have to say is 
an ex this is an example of where what I think of as like the American open source community has failed in a different way. Even one of the most progressive thinkers, Joshua Pierce, who's the editor of the magazine Hardware X, which is dedicated to open source hardware designs, they absolutely insist they will not publish a paper unless you can build the device from the paper. That's you, you can't publish in Hardware X if you don't do that. But they don't say, and you can maintain it, and you can repair it, and you can sanitize it, and you can wash it. They, they don't add that. And, and then I'm not blaming Joshua. He's a, he's a very you know, forward thinker. But what we need is maybe we need a journal dedicated to, I would use the word ruggedization for this, but there, we can probably come up with a better word for doing that and use the same open tech source technologies, which we have applied to developing the thing in the first place to make the devices very innovative in a way in which they're rugged. Now, part of the problem is who's gonna pay for that? As, as it was said, as Jenny Malloy said earlier, quality costs money and it takes time to do these things. I personally believe this is where the granting agencies need to step up because it's for 10 years, it's gonna be very hard for a university professor to get much of a paper out of saying, I made my device dust proof, right? It's not as, ex as exciting as saying I made a new device, even though it may be just as important for saving lives. But the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation could give money and say, you know, we demand that this device be tested in a very harsh environments in order to solve some of these problems. Okay, I know I'm not asking you a question, I'm just spouting things out. Okay, but there's one other thing I want to say that relates to um, something that we um, uh, talked about in Rehive after the conference on Saturday, and that's training. Okay, why does training relate to the open source community? Normally, we kind of, if you think of me as a typical American open source software developer, we don't think very much about training, okay? But we can, because to build a training device doesn't require FDA approval the way a therapeutic device does, okay? So for, for example, um, we, Public Invention makes this device. It's an open source device. It's for testing ventilators. You plug it in an airway and it measures flow, pressure, humidity, temperature, and oxygen. Okay, it's not as cheap as what Imtero uh, Sinjani made. This costs $250, his device only costs $40. This does a little bit more, okay? This is not an FDA approved device. It's not ready to be used on a patient. If you plug it in and there's a patient on the other side, you're violating US law, okay? But if you, if you use a test lung, it's okay. However, I believe this would be an excellent training device for people who have to repair um, ventilation equipment or oxygen concentrate. And it's not violating any regulatory authority to do that because, because you don't need that. What, what the open source community has shown that it's good at is building on things, but you gotta, have a, you gotta have a step that you can step on. And it seems to me that training and something that Victoria Jacqua mentioned last time, which is, creating biomedical response teams. And she, she didn't mean doctors, she meant equipment repair response teams, yeah. you know, basically. Um, that is something which is, is within our grasp. Like we can really do that. I think, I think we can achieve that much more easily than we could build an Africa-wide safe and effective ventilator. Like th that's a much easier problem than trying to, trying to build uh, a ventilator and get it approved by every regulatory body in, in Africa. Um, so I'm, I know I've been talking a lot, but there weren't too many questions uh, answered here. Uh, people have said a lot of nice things about your talk, Debbie. You should read it in Zoom. Uh, 